is adding to the sense of foreboding. Although it was a splendid property with beautiful gardens, there was something about the place that drew comparisons, at least in a literary sense, to Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, set south of the border. My thought in that regard was no doubt inspired by my newly acquired knowledge of the sordid history of its previous owner, James Wedderburn. James Wedderburn had been accustomed to being in charge, and so he had a commanding view of the countryside from his perch at Inverse Lodge, as most great houses on the plantations in Jamaica had, of the properties and those working in bondage. There was even a road, Wedderburn Lane, which ran alongside the property named after him. While the final resting place of Robert Wedderburn is not known, the remains of James Wedderburn and several other members of his family are interred in the graveyard at St. Michael's Parish Church, situated across the road from Inverse Lodge. It had taken some time for Jeff Palmer to discover Wedderburn's grave, but through persistence, he eventually uncovered it, hidden behind overgrown shrubbery. He triumphantly recreated for me the drama of his discovery of the site and confirmation that there indeed lay the remains of a man whose inglorious ties to Jamaica he had been documenting. It took me quite a lot of research just saying, well, where could he be buried? He explained as he pulled back the thorny leaves of a holly to finally reveal the gravestone off in a corner of the cemetery. As we stood there in that graveyard, contemplating the now dishonorable place in history that this man, James Wedderburn, occupies, one could not escape the irony of its location in a sacred churchyard. The strains of amazing grace solemnly played by bagpipes took occupancy of a place in my mind as I ruminated on the, that cruel passage of history. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I don't know if you all got as 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 caught up in the story as i did you almost didn't want it to end like just read the book to us while you're at it thank you so much so earl how how did you get in contact with 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 this story with with this experience how how how, how, you, how you fit in <laughs> uh, i i don't quite recall when first i got so deeply interested in, in Scotland and its role, its place in Jamaican history. And by the way, thank you so much, Nirvan, for, 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 for that uh, very, very well um, done presentation there, that, that reading of that passage. Uh, it helps when to have colleagues like Althea, like Nirvan, and like Roberta White Morgan, who you will hear from next, who are able to, to translate and to, and to present the material in, in such a way. But you, you may recall that in terms of the history that we were taught in high school, it didn't dwell too much on the, on, on, on the evils of slavery, though, you know, there had been some amount of, of re reformation, so to speak, of the curriculum had, had begun at the University of the West Indies. And so we had begun to learn a little bit more of that aspect of our history. But I had found it very interesting that there wasn't very much said about the Scots. It was more about the English, you know, the glories of English conquest, taking Jamaica, for example, from the Spanish in 1655. But what about those who were the ones to actually run the plantations, the ones who were suddenly so involved in plantation society in Jamaica. It just so happened that the Scots, when they joined the union, 
with England in 1707. They then took advantage of the opportunity. The Scots had failed in their own attempts at establishing a, a, a colony uh, in the Panama region, or what is now Panama. And they had lost a lot of their own fortunes there. And they had lost significantly in their continuing wars with, with the English. So after the union with, with England, they then had this opportunity to benefit significantly from the wealth of the sugar plantations in Jamaica and elsewhere in the region, but particularly in Jamaica. And I became very interested in that aspect of, of our history. And then I met Professor Jeff Palmer, a Jamaican who has been living in the UK and more particularly in Scotland for much of the last half century. And through, through his own research, I became more familiar with some of the individuals and the personalities of, uh, that have emerged from history as being very, very involved. And so we went to several cemeteries. It wasn't just at St. Michael's Church. We, we went to the cathedral in Glasgow and we went into the, the, the necropolis above um, the cathedral in Glasgow. And we looked at some of the names and you, Ewing, for example, and many of those, and then we came across Cunningham and we came across the Wedderburns. And the story of, of James Wedderburn and his son, uh, John Robert, uh, I focus at this particular section of the chapter on their story. Um, this was based in Westmoreland. That's where James Wedderburn had several estates. And then he had this mulatto son by an enslaved woman, Rosanna. And after he left Jamaica, the son followed him eventually to Scotland and tracked him down and tried to, 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 to gain, to get something from him so that he could start his life anew in Scotland uh, or in the United Kingdom. And he was driven away as I described it there. And so that's a very telling story. This is a story that ran from the 18th into the early to mid 19th century. And that story is reflective of so many of uh, other families in terms of their history. The, the Scottish presence in Jamaica is very strong. And if you, if you go to a place like Treasure Beach, where I'm from, interestingly, you come across names like Hamilton and you come across Buchanan and many other Scottish names and Campbell. And you see the link between them and the Scots. Although an interesting part of that, or a puzzling part of that history is that the Treasure Beach area is certainly not one where you'd have found sugar plantations, I don't think, because given the arid nature of that area. But so there might be a particular reason separate from that why there are so many Scots, um, so many Scots settled in that area. But the more fundamental point is that Scotland benefited significantly in terms of its economic growth and turnaround from the, its involvement or its people's involvement in Jamaica. And I've often felt that the route to um, reparations from the United Kingdom, Kingdom will actually go through Scotland, that perhaps an independence Scotland, if it, if it comes to that, may take the lead in terms of a government-to-government -government recognition of and conceding that, that, the, that a, a, a state needs to pay rep um, reparations. Because up to this point, what you have, the momentum is building in terms of the academic institutions, University of Glasgow, for example, has um, entered into an agreement with the University of the West Indies for a certain level of reparations. We have seen now where some companies that benefited and a few families that benefited have begun to, to pay reparations, but nothing yet from the governments. And it will be interesting to see what happens. So I thought that that particular story, I had to include it as one of the chapters. Absolutely interesting, especially for the lovers of history. I'm sure they are quite intrigued. And I see one avid historian here nodding very passionately. All right, so we'll have our third reading from Roberta White Morgan, a former colleague of yours from the RGR newsroom. Welcome, Thank Roberta. Thank you so much. Good evening to everyone here. I am pleased and privileged to be able to share this excerpt from the book of my mentor. And now I'm pleased to say also my friend, Earl Moxell. Here we go. The very sparse service lasted no more than 40 minutes. The scripture readings, tributes, 
and a brief sermon by the priest sandwiched by two hymns. Immortal, invisible God only wise, and guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Both songs taking me back to my days at Monroe College. Then it was over. With a gathering of friends exiting in a slow march behind the bearer of the urn, carrying those mortal remains. A life of great substance now reduced to ashes. A few of us lingered outside the circular building for a final few minutes, still shaken by the fate that had befallen our friend. Then my thoughts drifted back to his enduring questions in our final interview. Will we recognize the good man in our midst? When will we learn to let the good man live? This transplanted South Africa had indeed set down roots so deep in the Jamaican soil that not even death would separate him from us. In the script for my tribute, I had set out to capture the essence of the man, Peter Abrams. His passion for the good man reflected the goodness of this man. He was born in poverty, in an unjust society, but never lost his humanity. Belated enlightenment empowered him to light the way for others through his writings in the Pan-Africanist movement, through his global travels, and finally up at Koyaba with Daphne by his side. He viewed life from Koyaba and in turn inspired us through his writing and his commentaries. To the end, his optimism was undimmed. So he made his case and the verdict is in. Here indeed was a good man, a very good man. Thank you, Roberta. Again, so ex excellently. Why, Earl, you, you really know how to pick the man. You have a talented Cad friends, hope they know them. I shall speak and learn. Thank you, Roberta. And so we spoke a little bit here about Peter Abrahams. Why him? Yes, and and I'm so grateful, um, Trudy, for, for for my friends. They indeed are to be treasured, and they have, as you said, they have brought the script, they have brought the words of this book to life. Um, which I think will will help our read our listeners here this evening to to get a grasp of the essence of of the the stories being told. Peter Abrams, I like so many Jamaicans, grew up glued to the radio way back when it was just you know an AM station, and I I, I saw my father and mother listening to to hanging on to every word. Uh, coming from Peter in his commentaries and on election nights when he would be leading that panel of commentators. And then when I got into journalism myself, when I entered RJR in 1992, I then met him. And I was so, I mean, it was such a privilege to meet this, this living legend. And he was such a humble person that before long, he was asking me for my opinion on various matters. And he would come into that newsroom with his, with his script and then he would stop by each of us and he would share pleasantries with us and then he would quiz us about what were, were our thoughts on the latest development. And before you knew it, he, that enabled him to develop his own ideas for his next commentary. And over time, he became more of a mentor. You know, it was, he was someone who uh, saw in young people something that perhaps beyond what they might have seen of themselves or in themselves. And he was able to, to give us courage and, and strength. And so I learned from him. So to the extent that I have sort of been able to gain some new knowledge along the way, Peter Abrams would have contributed in no small measure to that. And he certainly gave me confidence. Uh, he, to the end, at the end, he, he essentially gave me charge of elements of his legacy in terms of ensuring that his, his writing is, is preserved and that we can take and build on that. But he meant so much to Jamaica and the wider Caribbean and the world. He grew up, as we said, in, you know, in deep poverty in apartheid South Africa. 
And later in, in, in that same chapter, I make the comparison between Peter Abrams and the anti-slavery hero in the United States, Frederick Douglass. Peter was born in 1919. Frederick Douglass, it is believed, was born in 1818. And the conditions in which they were both born and spent their early years were not very dissimilar. Apartheid in uh, racism and the conditions of black people in 1919 South Africa and for much of the 20th century were not very different from the conditions in which first um, black people were born in the United States, uh, so particularly the southern section of the United States in, in 1818 and, and up until the time of the Civil War uh, and emancipation. Um, so those kinds of parallels. I think are important to, to, to draw on because sometimes people take for granted the, the strides that have been made and do not understand, for example, that in terms of the conditions that Peter Abrams fled from South Africa and the fact that he found in Jamaica, not just a place of refuge, but a place in which he felt comfortable. He said he found in Jamaica a little piece of Africa where he could find solace and where he could feel like a man. And then in the end, I mean, he made such, such great contributions to the Jamaican society. And then in the end, for his life to have been taken in the savage way that, his life, that it, was, it was taken away when he was almost at 100 years old, it certainly is something for us to pause and reflect on, something to a, a cause for us, for us to examine ourselves and re-examine where we are as a society and where we are heading. Uh, the, I think the life of Peter Abrams, as he lived it here in Jamaica and as he shared it with the world was an ennobling life. Thank you. Thank you. Remember you can contribute this question by putting in the chat or speaking here on the mic in chapel or commenting in the comment section on YouTube. Coming from the chat here on Zoom, Essa Henry Savage said she thought that Roberto the Sephiroth, immortal, invisible, just a verse of it. She also added that she was young. Her brothers used to sing, used to race to say good evening with Peter Abrahams when he came on to the radio as, as herself. She mentioned the song, Immortal, Invisible. And I noticed that from those three excerpts, we actually have hymns being mentioned. Is that coincidental? Is it something we can expect throughout the book? What, what's the significance of, of having hymns as a part of the presentation? I didn't set out to, it's certainly not a book of hymns, and I didn't set out to necessarily consciously um, include hymns along the way, but they were, it just so happens that they were so important to the narrative they were important to the story um, in each of these in each of these um, these chapters, um, and I would say that they are reflected reflective of my own grounding in the church and in and and in the gospel and and um, so I cannot divorce myself from that aspect of my my being when I when I am writing. Um, something as as important as this for me. I do not, in terms of my my daily journalism, I do not. Um, you, you don't necessarily see that kind of overt expression. But in terms of as I reflect on these various events and um, the the hymns as they emerge naturally in this narrative, they're important to the story I'm telling. That's, that story of Michael Manley's passing and the funeral, for example, that song, it, I mean, it, it, it echoed in my mind throughout that event at the National Arena. And then it was sung at the, at the funeral um, service uh, at, at, um, at Holy Trinity Cathedral. Um, the, the irony of Amazing Grace, um, it, as, as it occurred to me in that churchyard in Scotland. And of course, you know the history of, of, of that, that hymn. It, it was written by a former um, slave trader, a captain of a, of a ship that, that used to um, trade in, in, in Africans. 
Um, so I, I think it's important for us to, to, to get the point that we have this spiritual side that it, it, it infuses uh, my narrative and my thinking along the way. Um, and I'm very comfortable with that. If you, if you think in terms of the civil rights movement in the United States, the extent to which it was driven by, by those hymns and those Negro spirituals, I, I think it is, it is reflective of part of the human condition and the human spirit. And so can I just sprung up naturally? Yes, it, uh, it did. I'm, I'm gonna guess that there are more songs in other chapters of the book. Uh, one or two, uh, th there is a particular <clears throat> chapter, um, A Sea of Troubles, and, and we can mention the, each of the chapters, but in, in A Sea of Troubles, there's a story told to me by my mother um, when her, her brother was brought back, his body was brought back by a sea. And, um, you know, the, the men, as they are rowing that boat back to the shore with the body, um, the signal to those on the beach that in fact he was dead, was that they started singing a particular song, um, Home Once More, the prodigal returns to his home once more. And um, it, it went, as my mother told me that story and her, her, her own mother responded to the strains of that song, then um, it, I could not escape sharing that particular story and that particular song as part of the narrative. And, and let, me, let me hasten to make the point that, as, as you said earlier, and let me just stress the point that this is not an autobiography by any means, but yes, aspects of my family story, um, you know, they do come, they do emerge in the narrative naturally, in, uh, and particularly in certain chapters that being one of them, a, a sea of troubles, because it speaks of the, the, the history of um, fishermen being lost at sea and many of them perishing at sea. And that is what got me into focusing so much in, in terms of reporting on the, on the struggles of our fishermen and okay. the safety and security issues that they faced at sea. And over time, I think we're able to influence the authorities to improve the conditions for fishermen in that way. But that, 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 that emerged from my own closeness to the fishing village, the families, and in fact, the most, the most um, infamous of those um, tragedies, the sinking of the snowboy in 1963. My mother was seven months pregnant with me when the snowboy went down and two of my father's cousins, first cousins were among those who perished. And my mother walked from district to district with um, carrying me uh, with her as she was then seven months pregnant. And as she shared in the grief of each family member or the relatives of those who were lost. I, as I've said in the book, I think I was infected by the virus of her grief. And so I grew up with the story of the snow boy and that tragic event in which 39 Jamaicans and their Australian captain perished in that incident. I couldn't avoid um, being close to the fishermen and their interests and emerging from that experience. What I'm seeing though in the, in the chapters that I've, I've, I've interfaced with and, and whether read or have heard is that you're not just talking about the issues, but you're somehow giving us a peek into the humanity of it. So we're feeling the people who are there. I'm thinking of Miss Joyce. Miss Joyce comes towards the end of the book. And, and, and that little moment that you shared with Miss Joyce, you know, hearing her story, hearing her. You know, sometimes we listen to the news and we hear the news. Yes but we're not hearing the voice of the people who are affected. Although ironically, they are the ones who are being interviewed. Yes. But that moment that you spent with Miss Joyce, you know, you, you, you're hearing that humanness and here you are expressing the, the raw emotions that your mother would have felt when that boat was being rowed in. You know, back with Joshua, you, goodbye Joshua, the, the, the feeling of the widow, you know, I, I, I'm moved by that, that inclusion of that aspect of humanity that we very often miss 
in the news, which you are presenting, highlighting, um, but certainly giving us another perspective, something else to think about. It's not a sensational event, but it would have been something that has impacted someone in a very personal way, almost pulling us into the things that are happening around us today and asking us what is happening with the people who are involved, you know, and almost begging us to become involved in the current events of the day, not just bystanders, but perhaps active participants in whatever way we can. Uh, On target, get, not your intention? No, no, you, you, you get it. In the case of Miss Joyce, for example, how that emerged was that I was at home, I was actually at home that evening um, watching the television news, my own television, my own station. I was already at home when I saw the initial report of this elderly woman uh, who's, she was a, a, a vendor, um, a higgler on Haywood Street. And the, the police had come down on them with a heavy hand and they had smashed their goods and their, their stalls and thrown them into a truck and driven off. And she was left there, I think, with her, with her, uh, her hands on her head, wailing or uh, weeping silently. And she looked so forlorn. She looked so alone. And she did not look um, well. And as I sat there, I was not seeing her through the eyes of a journalist. I was not seeing her through the eyes of a fellow Jamaican, a fellow human being. And I wondered, what is her story? What's the story beyond that moment when her livelihood was taken away from her? And I felt compelled to go in search of her the following day. So what was somebody else's story? Became my story the following morning. I called one of her most reliable cameramen and we went running down to Haywood Street. I hardly slept the night before and we went down there and found her and got to know a little bit more about the human being behind that story, that moment of Sorry. pain. And she, unknown to me, the camera was running when she then having Give, having gotten the opportunity to share her story, when she reached up and, and um, gave me a, a hug of gratitude. And normally you would not see that in a newscast in a report. And I asked myself several times whether there was any news merit in including that in the subsequent report. And I came down on the side of saying, well, I believe the audience, those who were so disturbed, who were so outraged the night before, would take some solace from seeing her with that smile and that hug of gratitude. Not, it wasn't about me, but just wanting them to see that Miss Joyce had had a moment um, of relief. Of hope, yeah. Of, of hope. Relief. And in fact, there was an outpouring of support for her and significant contributions were made. And it made a it, it made a difference in her life. It Miss Joyce had been had had um, surgery for cancer not very long before, and yet in her mid seventies or, or 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 older, she was there still struggling to make two ends meet on um, Haywood uh, on Haywood Street. Wow. Coming also in the chat here on Zoom, what awesome readings, the selections, the speakers were extremely well chosen. I'm in armor already and wait with anticipation to read the whole book. Congrats, Earl. Looking forward to reading your book that's coming from Kirk Wilson and Miss Sister Paulette Ulett. All right, Peter Abrahams, I remember What a Voice, coming by Maurice Jones. So the chapter's in order, an inauspicious start on the beat by Joshua, the NDM, the politics of crime, of gun and tears, CIA intrigue, the battle of Seattle, 9-11, Obama visits, colonial whirlwind, Scotland, Costa Rica, 1938, a sea of troubles, Miss Joyce, Peter Abrahams, beyond criti cricket. <laughs> So you look at so many things in this one book, so many aspects of our history, 
so many aspects of our culture in this one book. How are you able to kind of just tie all up to, to make, it both, make it table? Because it's so that you're giving to us. In I, I missed a little bit of what you were asking there. Just now there was some buffering. I wonder if you could repeat. I was asking, how were you able to pull all these different things together in one book to make it palatable for us? Because it looks on so many aspects of the culture, of our history, you know. Well, I, I hope the readers will, will find some satisfaction in what I've done and who have gone about it. So yes, there are different, different um, many different stories and themes um, in throughout the book in terms of these chapters. But I think that there is a sort of a string um, that connects them all. And if, if, you, if you think about it, or if I were to give a description of what I think I have set about doing, is that it, the book reflects um, perhaps my own, my own aspects of my own philosophy, my own um, social outlook, my own sense of, of right and, and wrong, uh, um, while at the same time sharing with the readers some of the important pieces of just sharing straight pieces of our history that some might have forgotten, some young people might not even be aware of. So for example, the chapter on the NDM, the National Democratic Movement, that was a significant moment in Jamaican history and politics in the mid 1990s, mid to late 1990s. And at the beginning, it certainly promised to be a, a, a movement, a political party and movement that would have stood the test of time, but it did not happen. So to have given persons the insights into, the readers the in, insights into the reasons for its establishment in the first place, the thinking behind its founders and the, the forces that saw to its early popularity and then its, its demise. I, I think it's very important just from the point of view of a student of Jamaican history. Um, the, the, the chapter uh, called the, the politics of crime that, that was taken, you may notice that it is in quotes because that was a title for a landmark program that was done at RJR in um, 1996, hosted by Hugh Crosskill. And it, it was an effort to bring uh, all the contending parties and forces, parties and forces, and when I say parties and forces as well, um, together to discuss the roots of our, of our crime problem and, and possible solutions. And this was the first time that we were, we were having a, a simulcast uh, of a program with RJR and its main rival, JBC at the time, JBC TV, in fact, which later RJR ironically purchased and, and renamed it Television Jamaica. Then there was KLS and then there were a couple of overseas stations that joined. It was, it was a momentous occasion, but unfortunately, the, the high hopes that many had for this forum did not achieve the sort of solutions that they were hoping for. And we have seen what has happened in terms of our history since then. Perhaps it was never achievable, but I, I thought it, I still think it was important that that effort was made. And some of it resonates to this very day. One of the suggestions that were made at that forum was for an initiative that is very similar to what we now have in terms of um, the the, the special legislation that has that has been enacted to enable the police to go in and um, hold and clear a, a, a particular community and and see to its rebuilding over time. So there are things that that resonate um, today from back then, but no one initiative will ever solve the problem of crime. And, and, and speaking of solving the problem of crime, there's one in terms of, of, of guns and tears in which I take on directly the problem of, of, of gun violence in Jamaica and the role of American guns in fueling the crime problem in Jamaica. I do not shirk from that. 
Well, we certainly appreciate your boldness in undertaking this project. We appreciate that you not only share matters of past and current events, but you are sharing a little bit of yourself as you pour out onto these pages. Barbara and that's White very difficult for me, you know. I'm a very shy person. Thank you so much for taking the, I, all right. I, if you say so, if you say so. If you say so, Barbara White on YouTube is intrigued, can't wait to read. And it was, in fact, Ken Wilson who uh, issued those congratulations. And he is looking forward to reading your book. I'm sure Kirk is too, but just giving, you know, credit to the right author of that comment. I don't know if there are any other questions or comments. Simone Maddox chiming in on YouTube as well and Exquisite Feast. A fitting homage to our colorful existence. What a top-notch 60th birthday gift to Jamaica. Thanks, Earl Moxham and friends. I think so. When, when can we look forward to getting our hands on your book? Well, I was hoping for mid-August, but I've had, um, I've had a, a, a significant setback um, with the passing of my dear mother recently. And um, so we have... Please accept our condolences. Thank you. And so we have had to reschedule. And so I'm, I, I believe it will be closer to September that we will be able to release the book. Um, but have no fear, it, it, it will be available pretty soon. And it will be a part of our 60th celebration, certainly, because we know we are getting to this year, as you said, pretty, pretty soon. Thank you so much. I don't know if there are any other questions. Where, where can we get it when it's out? Will it be online only or will we be able to get physical copies? Um, you will be able to get physical copies. I don't want to name any particular store right now, but, but arrangements are being made for it to be available. For bookstores. In, in, in the bookstores, it will be available online as well. Um, so there will be many, many um, sources um, for purchasing of the book. Awesome, awesome. Please let us know. Will you do an audio edition? Asks Jeffrey James. Lots of people have been have been asking me and suggesting to me that that should be done. I believe that ultimately that should be done, but to me it is a it, it, it's an awesome responsibility to to sit down and and to to do an entire audio version of, of the book. Um, so it, it probably won't be the first order of business, but, it, but eventually. Thank you so much. Congrats, Earl. Excellent presentations. I can't wait to get the book and to interest some folks overseas that coming from Edna Walker. See, super gift just in time for Christmas. So you can see that we are eagerly awaiting your book and we wish you all the very best in this endeavor, as well as in your general career. I don't know if there are any questions from our door. I don't know if there are any more in the chat as we round off this evening. The Vantage Point Jamaica, a reporter's chronicle, the first of many books, let me find that out there, the first of many books by our own brother, Earl Moxham. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our specialists as well. Um, Alvin, Roberta, I going to call you by your first name, so that's what I've done. Thank you so much for joining us here. Earl, thanks for bringing your super friends to be with us this evening and absolutely enriching tonight's presentation. I'm going to ask that we just pause for prayer. And then we will have our closing song, If I Had a Hammer. Maybe it should be, If I Had a Pen, I would write. But we can hammer out in the meantime. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have given to us. You bless us and gift us individually and collectively. And we thank you for those gifts. And we pray, oh Father, for the boldness to use those gifts for what you have called us to use them for. So 
it's not really just about church work, some social work that needs to be done, as Brother Earl had here in his book, Oh Father, calling us to action, reminding us of some things, putting certain things into perspective, Oh Father. May we reflect on the gifts that you have given to oh God and see how best we can use them for your service, not just in church, in the chapel, oh Father, but for making the church generally, making the country, making the world a better place, not just for ourselves, but for our brothers and sisters. We pray, oh God, that you would go with us this evening as we leave this space, oh God, that you would continue to guide us and protect us, that we would hear your voice and listen to your voice, obey your voice, oh Father, and do that which you have called us to do, nothing more and nothing less. In all we do, oh Father, may our thanks and praise be to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come next week, we will revert to our usual Bible study series. I'm pretty sure you are anxious to see Reverend Layla once again, guiding us through our regular Bible study. But thank you for joining us for the 2022 version of our book club. It was so good to have had some of you in the chapel with us this afternoon and, this and for the evenings that came before the Kony Thank you so much for signing and for participating through the chats and through your other means of participation. And now the song, If I Had a Hammer. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening. All over this land I'd hammer out danger I'd hammer out a warning I'd hammer out love between My brothers and my sisters All over this land If I had a bell I'd ring it in the morning I'd ring it in the evening All over this land I'd ring out a danger I'd ring out a warning I'd ring out love between My brothers and my sisters All over this land If I had a song I'd sing it in the morning I'd sing it in the evening All over this land I'd sing out danger I'd sing out a warning I'd sing out love between My brothers and my sisters All over this land I've got a hammer and I've got a bell and I've got a song to sing all over this land it's the hammer of justice it's the bell of freedom it's a song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land to the Mars Town Youth Jam. We'll be playing the song if I... Thank you so much. Please receive the benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you much harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice Glorify the God and Father of our land, of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Keep safe. You too. God Thank you. God bless well you. Done. Well done.
Bye. Thank you so much, Trudy. She said you were former colleagues. <laughs> Who's that? Oh. Edna Walker. Yes, indeed. Saying special hello to Durban. <laughs> Hi, Durban. Back in the day. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> I miss you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good evening. Okay. Good night. Well done, Mr. Moxa. Thank you, sir. Thank you all so much. I owe you. No, you don't. <laughs> we owe you. <laughs> oh, yes, nice, sir, indeed we do. <laughs> oh, boy. Thank you. Take no care. Problem. All the best. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trudy, again. Earlier to speak. Indeed. Thanks. Amen.